Hey, Jody here. This week's video is about old school stick welding. I'm using an old school stick welder transformer machine I bought off Craigslist a few years ago. Old school helmet, nothing auto darkening or anything like that. Uh, two foot long T-joint, vertical uphill with 7018. It takes me back to when I was in welding school, 19 years old, 40 years ago. Uh, we did four foot long vertical T-joints. And the benefit of that was, number one, you, you put it about two inches off the concrete, roughly, and um, it gave you a lot of practice on repositioning your body, a lot of practice on stops and starts. It's kind of an endurance test as well, which is pretty, you know, pretty necessary. Uh, but the four-foot tee also became an incentive for folks to stay in their booths that, that like to hang around the Coke machine or the water fountain or whatever. Uh, the instructor, this is a different era, mind you, back then, it was not uncommon for the instructor to headbutt somebody or literally kick them out of the classroom foot to butt. A few times he made people blow a hole in their four foot long T-joint with a, with a torch, put a big chain on it, and tell them, every time I see you outside your booth, I want that T to be around your neck. So, you know, that's some different stuff that doesn't fly today, but it's, it makes for a good story, right? My friend Alex Brown, he's Caveman Welder on Instagram. We had him on the podcast, Welding Tips and Tricks podcast, if you don't know about that yet. Um, we had him on the podcast, and, and uh, he sent me this afterwards, a modified Pipeliner helmet with a Selstrom flip front on it, and it's cut down a little bit to make it lighter and smaller with a little bit of a leather chin, chin flap on there. It feels really nice, really lightweight. And the benefit of a, of a flip front like this, if you're not going auto darkening, is um, number one, it's just not going to fail you. Number two, you can, it doubles as a grinding shield. Very handy for wire brushing or grinding or something like that if you can't find your grinding shield or just don't want don't to have to switch. So thanks, Alex, for the helmet. Uh, let's get on with the welding of the T-joint. Now, I'm doing a two-foot T-joint today. Just didn't have time for all that welding on a four-foot. Oh, one more thing. One more thing, uh, this should post a week, about a week before Fabtech 2016 in Vegas, so I don't really have all the details on where I'm going to be, but I'll put them in the description box of the YouTube video. There's a text box right underneath the, the video. I can change that at any time, so if it changes between now and then, I can, I can change it really quickly, whereas you can't change stuff inside the video. So check the description box. I'm going to try to list where I'll be at least for an hour window each day so that I can meet you, shake your hand, and talk, talk shop. Opening up a nice fresh can of Lincoln X Caliber 7018, 1-8, and getting ready to fire up on this thing. Right away I noticed, okay, that looks to me like around 115 amps. Wish I had just maybe five more amps or so. Listen how loud this machine is humming. I put this meter next to the machine with the camera on it so I could see what was going on, see where my amperage was, and pay attention to what's coming up here. See the handle move by? That's not supposed to be doing that. That means it's not holding amperage. Amperage is moving, it's vibrating and buzzing too much. So I had to stop right here and look into that. This is the little amperage mechanism thing here. It's a Miller Thunderbolt and uh, it's, it's gotten loose. So here's what the machine looks like on the inside. This will be real quick. I won't spend a lot of time here, but even the cooling fan's pretty loud. All right, the little shunt there that moves back and forth that changes the amperage has got some set screws on it, and in the manual they actually call them noise adjustment screws. When they get loose, it buzzes like crazy and also won't hold an amperage. It drips. So after tightening those screws up, maybe half a turn, things got a lot better. I'm trying to wear a respirator more these days, and that's a problem with this, this helmet from Alex. It doesn't fit very well under here. Uh, this is a 3M respirator with 2097 cartridges. Really the only one I've found that fits under most of my welding helmets. Still humming a pretty good bit, but way better than it was before. We're going to pay attention to stops and starts a lot. That is the benefit of doing a two foot or a three foot or a four foot long T-joint. You get a lot of practice making stops and starts. I light up in front and come back down into the crater of the previous bead. 
and try to weld over top of all the arc strikes. Here I bumped it up to 125 amps. The, the amperage is going to be something you've got to kind of balance out. You've got to have it hot enough so that you can make good restarts and get good penetration, but not so hot that you have to fight the puddle and constantly worry about undercut and the puddle sagging out and falling out with you. And also the higher the amperage, in my experience anyway, the more arc blow you'll tend to have toward the end of the welding rod. And uh, that can be a problem. Didn't get, I didn't capture any good shots here of, of arc blow really, but I, I encountered some here and there, mainly up toward the very end of the, of the, of the piece. All right, second pass. Generally, you can bump it up 5 or 10 amps for the second pass, or probably a lot of times you could just keep it the same. What you want to do when you when you start doing a little Z weave like this is is to hold those toes, hold the edges for a count. That's where you're going to have problems. Don't spend a lot of time across the middle. The middle usually takes care of itself. Hold the toes, pause there so that you avoid undercut, and then move fairly quickly across the middle. Here again, I'm lighting up, striking the arc ahead, coming back down into the crater, and then carrying on where I left off. Once again, that's kind of a, kind of exaggerated. I usually, probably come in, come down a little bit quicker than that. Also, I try to stop on the same side every time, and then and then light up on the on the side where I stopped. That tends to help. We'll do a quick restart here in just a minute. You'll see me stop on the left and then light right back up on the left. The quicker you can get back in there, the better. If you if you take a long time, you have to go get a drink of water or whatever, then you need to really need the chip slag and brush. But I find that if I can get back in there really quickly, that's that's actually more benefit than any chipping and brushing that I can do. Because everything's really good and hot and just melts right back together when you if you can get right, right back in there when it's really, really hot. All right, that's two passes. Time for the third pass now at 130 amps. Doing a little cue stick in here that, that helps you guide the, the arc strikes, keep them in, keep them in the zone where you weld over top of them. And what I do there is I'll guide it with my finger. But then eventually the rod gets pretty darn hot, so I have to, after things kind of steady up on me, I'll kind of e easily let go of the rod. But not having arc strikes to me is, is the, the main thing. They can fail you on a welding test. One arc strike can fail a welding test, so it's important to make your arc strikes in the zone where you're going to weld right back over them. Not the worst thing I've ever done, not the best thing I've ever done either, that's for sure. And as hard as I tried to guide where my arc strikes were, I got a pretty nice one right here. So, you know, I need to practice. I'll try to do one of these pretty soon, vertical uphill stacking stringer beads, because in the, in the uh, construction world and structural welding, a lot of times stringer beads are required. They frown on weaving like this. But... Weaving is still used, and uh, you know you probably need to do both. Thanks again to Alex Brown for the modded pipe liner. It's awesome. Um, hope to see you at Fabtech. See you next time.